Welcome to you all who have turned out to participate in the Protestant Reform Seminary's commemoration of the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. Together we remember God's great work in his church, restoring to her the gospel of grace and all of the outstanding benefits that are connected to that restoration of the gospel. Not only do we come together to commemorate, but we come together to resolve also by God's grace to preserve what he has imparted to us and preserved for us so that in 500 years, our children's children's children may gather perhaps in order to commemorate as we commemorate God's work of restoring the gospel to his church. Turn with me in your Psalters to number 394. Psalter number 394, versification of Psalm 145. We're going to sing the three stanzas. I ask that you arise as we sing. singing, I have been asked to ask you to squeeze in. If it may be possible to hold a few more in the sanctuary, we hesitate to put anybody in the balcony. <laughs> if you have room, hold a hand up or a finger or two for the ushers to see. Can you see ushers? It's fantastic that we have such a good crowd. We're very, very thankful for the turnout, for the interest in the conference and for the subjects. Gratifying to all our speakers who put in the hard work, hours and hours of research and putting together a speech. So we're very gratified. Still have a couple of hands up yet. If anybody 
Needs a place, take note of those hands. Nobody's asking questions, right? There's no questions <laughs> at this point, all right? No questions. Let's turn to God's Word. Isaiah chapter 8. Isaiah chapter 8. I've been asked by our speaker to read verses 13 through 20. Isaiah chapter 8 at verse 13. This is the Word of God. Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself, and let him be your fear, and let him be your dread. And he shall be for a sanctuary, but for a stone of stumbling, and for a rock of offense, to both the houses of Israel, for a gin, and for a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many among them shall stumble and fall and be broken and be snared and be taken. Bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples, and I will wait upon the Lord that hideth his face from the house of Jacob, and I will look for him. Behold, I am the children whom the Lord hath given me are for signs and for wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts which dwelleth in Mount Zion. And when they shall say unto you, Seek unto them that have familiar spirits, and unto wizards that peep and that mutter, should not a people seek unto their God, for the living, to the dead, to the law, and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. So far we read God's inspired word. Let's open with prayer. Almighty God and merciful Heavenly Father, we bow before thee and adore thee, great God of heaven and earth. We thank thee that we may know thee, to be our God, the God of glory, who is also the God of grace, the God of justice, who is also the God of mercy. Thou hast shown mercy to us in Jesus Christ, our Savior, and hast saved us from death and from woe, from hell, and from thy infinite wrath that we deserve on account of our sins. We thank thee for the gospel of grace and for the holy scriptures in which that gospel is to be found. Bless us as we commemorate together thy great work in the reformation of thy church, especially thy great work to restore to the people of God the word of God, the word which alone is the light that penetrates the darkness of this world, the darkness of sin and unbelief, the only light that shines until the dawning of the great day when our Savior, Jesus Christ, returns. Bless our speaker tonight. We thank thee for his presence among us. We look forward to the instruction of the word that he will bring the admonition of that word, as well as the comfort of that word. Stand on his right and left, equip him as only thou canst, and use him in a mighty way to accomplish thy purpose in our midst. Forgive graciously all our sins, and hear us for Jesus' sake. Amen. In order to keep on track, we'll keep the announcements to the minimum and save them for the end. I want to introduce our speaker at this time, the first of the two speakers for this evening, Reverend David Torlock. We are so pleased to have Brother Torlock as one of the guest speakers at our Reformation Conference this year. We are also grateful that his wife, Ruth, could accompany him and be with us tonight. Tomorrow, too. Reverend Torlock is a doctor turned preacher, not because of the money, obviously. 
a conviction that he could never escape. He left his medical practice in order to prepare for the ministry of the gospel when he enrolled at the Protestant Reform Seminary in 2006. He graduated in the top three of his class in 2009. He, <laughs> that was bad. <clears throat> My wife told me not to say that. <laughs> he was ordained as a minister of the Word and Sacraments in February of 2011 in the Evangelical Presbyterian Church of Australia. He is currently the pastor of the Brisbane Congregation of the Evangelical Presbyterian Church of Australia. He and his wife Ruth have five children, four of whom are married, and three grandchildren. A warm welcome to Reverend Torlock who will be speaking for us tonight on the Reformation's return to Sola Scriptura. Reverend Torlock. Thank you very much for that uh, warm welcome. First of all, I would like to bring Greetings to you all, to the Protestant Reformed Churches in America from the Evangelical Presbyterian Church of Australia. You may be assured that we hold you in high regard, that we love you, we love your witness for the truth, and indeed we pray for you often. So be assured of that. Secondly, I'd like to thank you for having me here. It's an honour and a privilege to be amongst you again uh, we formed very many uh, strong friendships with uh, you folk when we were here for those three years during my training, and it's a delight to be back amongst you again. But let's turn to the speech, that which I've been asked to speak on tonight. Uh, as you can see here, the Reformation's return to Sola Scriptura. I'd like to start, first of all, with Isaiah 8.20, we actually read that just before. To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Isaiah spoke those words to the visible church, to the Old Testament Israel. And he was called to speak those words because the church of that day had departed from the truth of God a very long way from the truth. They were seeking after wisdom and guidance and life and so forth from everything else but God. They were seeking it from the pagan idols. They were seeking such things from the philosophers of their day. They were even seeking it from the creation itself rather than the creator. But they had ceased to truly seek after God and his revealed and written word. God's revealed and written word is what is meant, of course, when it says to the law and to the testimony. If you have a law, if you have a testimony, they've been produced by someone. Here, of course, it's God. This is the law and the testimony of the living and almighty God. Isaiah is telling us because he's telling not only the church of that day, but the church in our day as well, that we have a perfect witness and a perfect law. It is God's. The creator and upholder of the universe has not left himself without witness. It is the infallible scriptures that we are able to hold in our hands. And further then, that scripture is that by which everything else is judged. If you take anything else and you bring it to the perfect light of that scripture and it does not fit, it's because there is no light in that thing that you are bringing. It is that by which everything else must be judged. That wonderful and central truth that Isaiah brings here and which is also spoken of in many other places in the scripture is the essence of sola scriptura. So when we say sola scriptura, what are we talking about? Thankfully, that's one of those Latin terms that 
is a lot more under, easy to understand than many other Latin terms, isn't it? Scripture, Scripture. Sola, exactly what it says, meaning solely, alone, nothing else but. So we're talking about nothing else but the Word of God. Sola Scriptura is one of the five so-called solas of the Reformation. These solas were the great essential truths of Christianity that the Reformers of that day, the church of that day, came to, defined, described, and held forth as being central and fundamental to gospel truth. And the Reformation returned to that truth. In other words, by that we are saying that the church did in fact hold to that truth at one time. But sadly, the church then fell away from that truth over that thousand year period of the medieval times. But with the Reformation, wonderfully by God's grace, as we've been hearing already today, there was a return to those beautiful truths and particularly to this truth of sola scriptura. I've got to remember to click the button. This is one of the things my wife always tells me about. These are the things we've just been speaking about. Moving on to... <laughs> Tonight I wish to address then those, those four areas. First of all, what did the early church believe about the Scripture? Can we define that? Secondly, what was the era into which the church of that day degenerated? Thirdly, to what truth did the Reformation return? And finally, what's the relevance for us today? Let's take up those four things. First of all then, what did the early church believe concerning the Scriptures. With the early church, it was our Lord Jesus Christ who established His church here upon the earth. He ascended into heaven 40 days after His resurrection, but He had already begun the establishment of that New Testament church. He began it when He gathered His 12 disciples to Himself and spent three years teaching them and others as well. But then he poured out His Holy Spirit on the church in Pentecost and so fitted His people to be ready to be about the work that He'd called them to. And particularly the apostles as they went about the work of preaching the gospel. First of all in Jerusalem, then Judea, Samaria, and then into all the world. But as the apostles went about doing that work of preaching the Word of God, by and under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and performing those great works such as the healings and the miracles and the speaking in tongues which gave God's stamp of approval that this was indeed His true Word, the Holy Spirit was also causing them not only to preach the truth but to write it down. And the Holy Spirit was therefore moving these holy men to write the scriptures of the New Testament at the same time as the gospel was going out into all the world. By AD 95, the Spirit had completed the work of giving the scriptures. As 1 Corinthians 13.10 says, But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. So the Holy Spirit, having completed that work through these men of writing down the scriptures, after that time then, there were no more apostles and no need anymore for those special signs of the miracles and the tongue speaking and so forth. And all those went away because we had completely, fully, the Scriptures from the Old Testament running right through and the New Testament. As we move then into the period of the early New Testament church, once the apostles had gone, we need to ask ourselves, what did the early church fathers believe concerning that completed canon of Scripture that they now held in their hands? We can get an insight into that by looking at some of the writings of the early church fathers. So let's turn to look at a number of them. We start with Irenaeus. As you notice from his dates, he's there in the 100s, in the 2nd century there. 
Irenaeus was a bishop in Gaul, and he wrote extensively against many errors that were already coming into the church. He wrote, We have known the method of our salvation by no other means than those by whom the gospel came to us, which gospel they truly preached. So he's saying there that this is how we receive the gospel because it was preached to us by mouth and we heard it in our ears. But notice he then says, but afterward, by the will of God, they delivered to us in the scriptures to be for the future the foundation and pillar of the truth. So what he's saying is initially, the truth came by the preaching. It came orally and it came to us in that way and filled our hearts. But then the Holy Spirit moved for those scriptures to be placed in writing. And that was the foundation and pillar of the truth. The scriptures were that important. Let's move on to Cyprian. Because, you see, even as we say those things, it raises an interesting question, isn't it? You've got the, those living in the day, say back in Irenaeus, who are people that have actually heard the apostles teach and preach. Or they say, my father heard apostle so-and-so say this, and that this is the way we should do things in the church, and this is the doctrine that we should believe. As it were, there's an oral tradition that you're hearing. So who do you hold with? Do you hold with that which someone says they've heard the apostles say? Or do you hold with what you have now written in the Scriptures? Well, Cyprian, who you see there lived in the 200s, he answers that question somewhat when he was dealing with a particular tradition that had arisen within the church. He said, Whence comes this particular tradition? Does it descend from the Lord's authority or from the commands and epistles of the apostles? For those things are to be done which are there written. God witnesses and admonishes, saying to Joshua, the son of Nun, The book of this law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written therein. If it be commanded in the Gospels or the Epistles and Acts of the Apostles, then let this holy tradition be observed." He was saying there's nothing wrong with having that which has been heard by word of mouth, by the preaching and teaching, and that you know that your grandfather heard. That's fine, but it must be measured by the Word of God. If it's found in the Word of God, then we hold to it. It's Scripture alone which is our mark of what is right. Let's move a little bit later in time. We go to Athanasius in the 300s. He was a bishop at Alexandria. He said, The Holy Scriptures given by inspiration of God are of themselves sufficient toward the discovery of truth. That word sufficient means enough. We don't need anything else to have the truth given to us. And notice also he speaks of the inspiration of the Scripture, that it is God breathed. He also said this, the Catholic Christians, by that he meant universally, the Christian everywhere, will neither speak nor endure to hear anything in religion that is a stranger to Scripture, it being an evil heart of immodesty to speak those things which are not written. The Christian must speak, must reflect that which is written down in God's holy word. Let's go to Cyril of Jerusalem a little later in the 300s now. Cyril of Jerusalem here in this particular quote, he's talking to his students. He was a professor and taught uh, students for the ministry. And as he's teaching them, he says to them this, Not even the least of the divine and holy mysteries of the faith ought to be handed down without the divine scriptures. See what he's saying there? It, It doesn't matter. Even if it seems to be a very minor doctrine, it's not to be passed on in the church. It's not to be passed on by me, he says, to you as students, unless I can show you that it's found in the written word of God. That's what he then goes on to say there. He says, 
do not simply give faith to me, speaking these things to you, except you have the proof of what I say from the divine scriptures. For the security and preservation of our faith are not supported by ingenuity of speech, but by the proofs of the divine scriptures. One final quote from Augustine, late 300s going into the early 400s. He there says, There is a distinct boundary line separating all productions subsequent to the apostolic times from the authoritative canonical books of the Old and New Testaments. The authority of these books has come down to us from the apostles through the succession of bishops and the extension of the church and from a position of lofty supremacy claims the submission of every faithful and pious mind. In the innumerable books that have been written latterly, we may sometimes find the truth as in Scripture, but there is not the same authority. Scripture has a sacredness peculiar to itself. As we look at these various quotes, you notice that I've taken uh, the various church fathers from the 2nd through to the 5th century and also from various places around where the church was found. So no matter where you look geographically or across time, you see a belief in the authority, the infallibility, the sufficiency, the perspicuity of Scripture. Now that's not to say that you cannot find also amongst the church fathers some statements that might lead you to scratch your head and say, oh, that sounds a little unclear. But that's because the church in that day had not had so many of the attacks of heresy come against it to make it sharp and clear in its understanding. But nevertheless, we can see from these quotes, the early church understood the vital importance of Scripture alone. But following this time, sadly, the church was to undergo a great falling away into apostasy and into error. So secondly, let's have a look at that. Let's have a look at the error of the medieval church of Rome concerning Scripture. This is a, really a vast area and we could spend all evening looking at this. So I'm going to restrict us just to having a look at really two different aspects of this. What are we to understand is that as uh, Prof. Kaminger was speaking about earlier, from about 500 AD, the uh, Church of Rome started to develop with the centralization of power in Rome under the Bishop of Rome and all sorts of errors culminating in the papacy, a great hierarchical structure and sacerdotalism, the whole idea of the priesthood and the sacrificing of Christ again in the Mass. Huge amounts of false teaching that flooded into the church and with that, an increasing hatred of the truth of Scripture alone, a turning away from that truth and rejecting it. That can be demonstrated, therefore, in two things that I'd like to look at. The first is in their hatred of the truth of Scripture alone and secondly, in their positive setting forth of their lives. In order to look at their hatred of the truth, I've just taken one example, and that is of John Wycliffe. You notice from his dates that he was about 150 years before the start of the Reformation with Martin Luther. According to the church historian Philip Scarf, Wycliffe's legacy to the church was his assertion of the supreme authority of the Bible for clergy and laymen alike and his gift to them of the Bible in their own tongue. Wycliffe was really the one who began the translation of the Scriptures into the English language, for which we are exceedingly thankful. But we ought to understand that Wycliffe's work in this area and Wycliffe's assertion of the necessity of Scripture alone comes on a, an amazing background. The Council of Toulouse in 1229 had forbidden the use of the Bible to laymen. 
In other words, the ordinary person was not allowed to have a Bible, was not allowed to read the Bible. Not only that, but many of the clergy at that time, they were illiterate, the, the ordinary priests. And of course, we heard earlier from Prof. Kaminga, dreadful immorality that was there and worldliness from the top to the bottom of the whole of that Roman hierarchy. Wycliffe himself tells us that the modern or recent doctors of his time had even declared that parts of the Scripture were irrational, blasphemous, or abounding in errors. Isn't that incredible? But on the background of that, Wycliffe, as he studied the Bible in Oxford and then set forth the truth, he wrote a paper entitled, Of the Truth of the Holy Scripture. And in that, he maintained the supreme authority of the Scripture, that Christ's law suffices by itself to rule Christ's church. And he also upheld the possibility of the individual believer being able to read the Bible for himself and to know and to understand it. What was the Church of Rome's response to Wycliffe as he stood so strongly for Scripture and for Scripture alone? Did they applaud such things? Not at all. They actually attacked him during his lifetime but were not able to do anything directly against him. In fact, it was not until the Council of Constance in 1415 that they declared Wycliffe to be a heretic. Notice the date. He died in 1384. They declared him to be a heretic well after he had died, but they had such a hatred for him, they ordered that his bones be dug up and he be burned at that time and his ashes scattered in a river, which they did in 1428. Notice also the Council of Constance in 1415 was the same council that interviewed, condemned and burned John Huss for his holding to the truth of the Scripture as well. So you see there their hatred for the holding forth of Scripture and Scripture alone. But we can also look at the Council of Trent, which Prof. Kaminger also referred to earlier. 1546, and you notice the date there, this is not long after the Reformation has begun. And the Council of Trent was called together by the Roman Church, particularly established by Pope Paul III. It was in response to the Protestant Reformation and its purpose was to set forth all of the heresies that the Protestant Reformation was supposedly bringing forth. What do you think was the very first thing that they came to when this council met for a very long time? Scripture. Even the Roman Church recognized that Scripture was a central point that needed to be dealt with immediately. What did they actually declare? Well, I have a, a lot longer quote here, but I think we'll stick with the shorter one up here. They said, seeing clearly that this truth and discipline, and when they're talking about this truth and discipline, they're referring back to all that Jesus Christ had taught. So they're saying, the truth and discipline which Christ taught are contained in the written books and the unwritten traditions. So important to see that. Unwritten. Notice that these are things that are not written down. You still cannot go to the Roman Catholic Church in this day and age and say, can you give me a transcript of what the traditions are? Because they're not written. They're just supposedly handed down by mouth to mouth within the Roman Catholic Magisterium. So they say, these things are contained in the written books, in the Bible, and in the unwritten traditions, and therefore the Synod receives and venerates with equal affection of piety and reverence all the books of the Old and New Testament, and they include the Apocrypha in there, as also the said traditions and preserved in the Catholic Church by a continuous succession. So Rome, Council of Trent, back there at the same time of the Reformation, rejected all the Reformers were saying and said no, we are to have the Bible and traditions, our unwritten traditions, all of our beliefs. And that's the only way you can interpret the Bible is by having these unwritten traditions. And of course, that trumps the Bible because no matter what you say, the Bible says, they say, no, 
We are the ones that interpret it according to the unwritten tradition. This situation is what the pre-reformers faced, such as Wycliffe and such as Huss. It's also the situation that the reformers faced when they came to the Reformation. This was the situation. The Roman Catholic Church absolutely detested the doctrine of Scripture alone and said that the only way that Scripture could be truly known is by those who are in submission to the Pope and in communion with Him and through the unwritten tradition. And there was no way you could read or understand or put forth any truth except you were in full submission to Rome and her teachings. So to take the Bible and try to use it to argue against the Roman Catholic Church, she already had the predetermined arguments. She had the traditions. She had the magisterium. She had the Pope. And everything she said was automatically right. Let's look then at what the Reformation returned to. The return to Sola Scriptura. Martin Luther. Martin Luther is taken to be the one who really began the events of the Reformation with nailing his 95 theses to the church door in Wittenberg, of course, on October the 31, just a few days hence till we get to exactly 500 years since that time. What were these theses? These theses were assertions that he was making. They were conclusions that he had come to. How? By studying the Scriptures. By going back to the Bible and carefully looking at the doctrines that were involved with this, which came about because of the indulgences being sold by Tetzel. So he had researched the whole area of sin and punishment and penance and forgiveness and indulgences, and he then set forth his conclusions in these 95 theses. What he was seeking for is for debate. He wanted men to get together to discuss what the Word of God really said in order that they could either correct him or that the church could be brought back to what the Word of God really said. Now, it really wasn't anything special to put up theses like this. This was a normal method of debates and discussion and so forth. But what Luther did here was very radical because what he did was he was opposing the doctrines and assertions of the Roman church based upon an appeal to Scripture alone. That was indeed radical and indeed quite dangerous for that day because it was in doing so that Wycliffe and Huss had been condemned. In fact, many had lost their lives for doing just this. These actions of Martin Luther in researching and clearly setting down the truths of Scripture caused him to have a greater understanding as he read and meditated upon the Scripture. It caused him to grow in his grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ but of course, it also caused a huge amount of consternation, condemnation and hatred by the instituted church and especially the papacy. Luther came to love the scriptures more and more. And especially Galatians 3.15 meant so much to him. The just shall live by faith. That wonderful truth, as Prof. Kaminga mentioned before, of justification by grace alone through faith alone. Because of his forthright teaching, Rome knew that he had to be silenced. Or otherwise, their whole kingdom of darkness and lies would be threatened if the light of Scripture truly came to be born upon all of their false teaching. And therefore, after various attempts, they finally managed to have him summoned to the Diet of Worms in 1527 where he was asked to retract all of his teachings. Luther came prepared to debate. In fact, he'd asked on a number of occasions 
please show me where I am wrong from Scripture. And he asked the same thing again when he came before this particular deity. Show me from Scripture. That was denied. They were not going to debate. They were not interested in what Scripture said because, as I mentioned before, Rome is always right. You must bow to the Pope. And that's what Martin Luther was told. We don't want to hear anymore. What we want to know is the answer to one thing. Will you recant and submit to Rome? Luther's answer was that very famous one, which which I'm sure many of you are familiar, which appears partly on the poster out there at the front of our entrance when we come in. Luther said, I cannot submit my faith either to the Pope or to the councils because it is as clear as the day that they have frequently erred and contradicted each other. Unless, therefore, I am convinced by the testimony of Scripture or by the clearest reasoning, unless I am persuaded by the passages I have quoted, and unless they thus render my conscience bound by the Word of God, I cannot and will not retract. For it is unsafe for a Christian to speak against his conscience. Here I stand. I can do no other. May God help me. Amen. That's a momentous occasion in the Reformation. Because Luther had spelled out what all the other reformers would likewise hold to. That scripture alone would be the rule upon which every church and every believer must stand and by which they must judge the truth. This same understanding continued with the other reformers. We could take countless reformers. Let's do a quick flick through some of them to see that this is the same understanding of them all. We go to, first of all, Ulrich Zwingli in Zurich. He wrote a confession which is entitled The 67 Articles. And there he states, All who say that the gospel is nothing without the approbation or approval of the church err and cast reproach upon God. He's saying... The scriptures don't need approval by the church. They stand in and of themselves. In 15, he said, Who believes the gospel shall be saved? Who believes not shall be damned? For in the gospel, the whole truth is clearly contained. Notice that, the sufficiency of scripture. And clearly, it's perspicuous. 16, from the gospel, we learn that the doctrines and traditions of men are of no use to salvation. Once again, he rejects the whole idea of traditions. Zwingli came to these understandings by himself, once again, through the study of the Scripture, not from Martin Luther. Moving on, Heinrich Bullinger, he was uh, the one who was the successor to Zwingli in uh, Zurich. He is also the main author of the Second Helvetic Confession, which was adopted not only right through Switzerland, but also by Scotland and Hungary and France and Poland. There he says in chapter 1, We believe and confess the canonical scriptures of the holy prophets and apostles of both testaments to be the true word of God and to have sufficient authority of themselves, not of men. And in this holy scripture, the universal church of Christ has the most complete exposition of all that pertains to a saving faith and also to the framing of a life acceptable to God. And in this respect... It is expressly commanded by God that nothing be either added or taken from the same. John Calvin, the esteemed John Calvin, once again, many quotes we could take, just simply a couple of extracts from his Institutes of the Christian Religion. Book 1, chapter 7, he said that the scripture is nothing else but inspired of God that is sprung from heaven It has its authority from God and not from the church. In fact, he said, the church has its foundation in the Scripture, not the other way around. Scripture doesn't have its foundation in the church, which is what Rome was saying, but rather the church has its foundation in Scripture. And in Book 1, Chapter 9, he points out the authority, the clarity, the sufficiency of Scripture are all tied to the work of the Holy Spirit. Moving to Scotland, 
I love John Knox, very forthright man. He had many opportunities to speak to the monarchs of Scotland and particularly to Mary, Queen of Scots. And this is one particular exchange that is recorded. There, Mary said to him, You interpret the Scriptures in one manner and they in another. Whom shall I believe? Whom shall be judge? She wasn't really asking a sincere question. She was comparing the great bulk of the Roman Catholic theologians and what they said about Scripture as compared to what John Knox was saying about the interpretation of Scripture. Knox's answer was as we have there. He says, You shall believe God that plainly speaks in His Word. And further than that the Word teaches you, you shall neither believe the one nor the other. You see what he's saying there? You're not supposed to simply believe the Roman church. And he says, don't believe just me either. You need to believe the Word of God. And notice he says, God speaks plainly there. The clarity, the perspicuity of Scripture. He says, if there appear any obscurity in one place, the Holy Ghost, which is never contrarious to Himself, explains the same more clearly in other places, so there can remain no doubt, but unto such as obstinately will remain ignorant. He certainly wasn't backward in coming forward, was He? And uh, speaking such things even to the monarch. But notice once again there that clear Reformation principle that comes out in that quote, that Scripture interprets Scripture. There with Knox. We could go on multiplying examples. Many of the reformers wrote about Scripture, particularly as they came up against all the attacks, not only from the Roman church on the one side, but also from the radicals on the other. And Lord willing, we'll hear somewhat more about that from Prof. Dykstra tomorrow. But we must move on to ask, can we put all this together? We can multiply quotes from everywhere, can we really know what the reformers and what the Reformation brought out as one solid, distinct truth that we can lay hold upon and see easily? Yes, we can. And most wonderfully, because at the time of the Reformation, they put together all those wonderful reform confessions and creeds. Those confessions and creeds were not only adopted by whole denominations, but sometimes even internationally, as I've already mentioned with the Second Helvetic Confession. And they also passed their confessions and creeds to one another and approved them also, so that the whole body of the Reformed and Presbyterian Church were in fact united. And particularly in this doctrine, there is no difference across all of the Reformed churches. So we can, in fact move and have a look at the confessions to see what the truths were they held to. We could spend lots of time looking at the different ones, but let's just give a brief summary. What did they believe? First, that the Bible is inspired. It is wholly and completely inspired in every part, in every word, in the original languages. More than that, the 66 books of the Bible they are the only books that are inspired. There are no other inspired writings that God has given to His church. Arising out of this of necessity, there are no errors in the Bible. It is inerrant and infallible. Of necessity also, therefore, the Bible is authoritative. It is the authority over the individual, over the church. Indeed, it's even authoritative over kings and presidents and nations, regardless of whether they will admit to that or not. Next, they believed that the Scriptures are the only foundation for truth in all of faith and life. In this way, the Scriptures are absolutely necessary. Without the Scripture, there can be no wisdom. Without the Scripture, there can be no salvation. They also held to the Word of God being sufficient. I've mentioned this before, that it is enough, that there is no more that is necessary for man to have. Now, that doesn't mean that the Scripture contains every single fact in the world. 
we know that that's not so. It doesn't even contain every single fact about God because God is infinite and we cannot put down in the Scriptures about Him. But everything that is necessary for us to know about God and about salvation and how we can come to life in Him and how we are to live our lives, every principle for every situation in life is found in the Holy Scriptures. The Reformers also came to the conclusion that the Word of God is perspicuous. I've used that a few times. A word that means clear. Yes, the Scripture is exceedingly profound and deep. It is written by God Himself. But that does not mean that in any place the Scripture is confusing or paradoxical. A favorite resort to heretics to say that there's a paradox in the Scripture. The Scripture is so clear that a little child can know the Scriptures from a very young age, like Timothy in the Bible. They also said that to understand the Scriptures needed the work of the Holy Spirit because the Scriptures are spiritually discerned. But they also pointed out that Spirit and Word were never separated the one from the other. The Holy Spirit always used the Word of God. Taking all of this together, we may quickly conclude that this truth of sola scriptura was vitally important, not only for the foundation, but for the progress of the Reformation. But it also meant this. It meant the Reformers, the preachers of that day, as they took up the Word of God and they knew that it was Scripture alone, then as they took it and they understood it by the Holy Spirit and as they preached it and declared it, They were willing to lay down their lives for that truth because it was the very Word of God and inerrant and infallible. They were willing to shed their blood for that truth. They could also preach the Word of God with an absolute confidence, knowing that that Word was that which saved people's souls. Not only, but the people then heard the clear truth of the Word of God in their ears and the elect hearing that truth, and by the work of the Spirit, they heard the voice of the shepherd, and they came to the truth in great numbers with a great reformation work by the power of the Spirit and the Word. But sola scriptura also meant that the opponents were defeated. Rome and the radicals, they tried to bring forth many arguments, but the reformers holding to the Bible alone showed that the Scripture was sufficient to deal with all the wiles of the evil one. Trusting in the sword of the Spirit, they were able to defeat spiritual wickedness in high places. A wonderful return to sola scriptura. But what about the relevance for today? You might say, What's the point in talking about all these events from 500 years ago? Is this kind of just a talk fest for history buffs, is it? Maybe we're better off talking about matters for today. Well, let's finish then with looking at this, at the relevance for today. And let's to do that, let's go to Scripture because... It ought to be Scripture alone that ought to guide us in answering that question too. Why is it relevant? Ecclesiastes 1 verse 9 says, The thing that hath been is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun. You can be sure that those same struggles that occurred in the church of the past and way in which it deteriorated into that horrible darkness and away from Scripture, that can happen just as much today. And we are seeing it. Let me ask you also this, in the Bible, it's a little bit of one of those sort of, you know, quizzes, in the Bible, what are the very first words that we hear Satan say? Yea, hath God said? You see, it's Satan's delight to turn the people of God away from the Word of God. That's his delight. It always has been. 
It's His determination that the people will be separated from the beautiful truth of the Word of God. In 1 Timothy 4 verse 1 then says to us, says to us in our days, because notice it speaks of the latter times. The Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times, these times in which we live, that some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. All of the doctrines that don't come from the beautiful truth of the Scripture, but from Satan who desires to separate us from having Scripture alone. And Peter warns us in 2 Peter 3 verses 16 and 17 that although there are some things that are not easy to understand in the Scriptures, hard to be understood, that those who are unlearned and unstable rest, twist to their own destruction. Yet nevertheless, he says to us, Ye therefore, beloved, seeing that you know these things before, and you're hearing them now, are you not? If you know these things before, beware, lest ye also be led away with the error of the wicked and fall from your own steadfastness. Do you think already? These things are relevant that we've been talking about. The Scripture tells us that they are. If we don't learn the lessons of the history that is past that God has set down for us and that we are recipients of the heritage of it, then we will likewise fall into those same errors and those same sins. It's no new thing that Satan is trying to overthrow Scripture and he's attempting to do it just as much today. Let's make it even more relevant. Rome hasn't changed, not since the Council of Trent in 1546. Are you aware that Roman Catholicism is, humanly speaking, the most powerful so-called Christian church around today? And of those who call themselves Christians in the world, 50% of them are Roman Catholics. Rome still believes the same things. The quote there is from the Catechism of the Roman Catholic Church, last published in 1992. If anything, it's become more clear what she believes. Notice both Scripture and tradition must be accepted and honored with equal sentiments of devotion and reverence. And even more importantly, the task of giving an authentic interpretation of the Word of God, whether in its written form or in the form of tradition, has been entrusted to the living teaching office of the church alone. Read there of the Roman Catholic Church because notice what it says then. This means that the task of interpretation has been entrusted to bishops in communion with the successor of Peter, the Bishop of Rome. The only way that you can ever know what the Bible says according to the Roman Catholic Church is if you believe your priests. You believe them. Don't bother reading the Bible. They will tell you everything you need to know. Put the Bible away. Are you aware also that 25% of those who call themselves Christians in the world today are of the Pentecostal charismatic ilk, including some, in fact, in the Roman Catholic Church. You'll find that the Pentecostals pay a lip service somewhat to the understanding of sola scriptura, so that in the Assemblies of God, 16 fundamental truths, you'll find that they say the Scriptures, both of the Old and New Testaments, are verbally inspired of God and the revelation of God to man and the infallible authoritative rule of faith and conduct. However, the focus of Pentecostal charismatic churches is not upon Jesus Christ and His work of salvation, but rather upon the so-called wonderful works of the Holy Spirit. As Frederick Brunner says in his extensive work on Pentecostalism, prophecy for them, and remember they hold to prophecy and tongue speaking and so forth as the works of the Spirit, prophecy is usually defined even by the more careful in the Pentecostal movement as something more than simply Spirit-inspired utterance, but as in fact the voice of the Spirit Himself. In prophecy we are told we have the speaking Spirit. Imagine that. The Holy Spirit, according to the Pentecostal movement, is right now moving people in their midst 
to speak the very revelation of God in their midst. How can you take a 2,000-year-old Bible and say, well, this is truth, and they say, oh, it's okay, we don't need that. We've got the Holy Spirit speaking to us right today. Put the Bible away. But there's even more that we contend against today. We live in a culture, a society, an environment in which Satan is attempting still to overthrow, even within conservative churches, the authority and the clarity and the sufficiency of the Word of God. And he does that through various philosophies, particularly talking about modernism and postmodernism that you will find indeed coming into the churches. To put it simply, modernism teaches that if anything is old, it automatically is outdated. And if it's outdated, then it's no longer useful to you. And if you're going to make things that are old useful, then you need to change them, adapt them, bring them up to speed, and then they can be useful. When you have that idea that comes into churches, what do they say? Well, the Bible's old hat. The Reformation's old hat. All those creeds and confessions back there, they're, they're old. They're outdated. And the only way they're ever going to be useful is you need to take them, change them, adapt them, make them to be what you want them to be, and then they can be useful in the modern church. And then you have a postmodernism, which is even worse. And postmodernism teaches that there is no such thing as objective, unchanging truth. They say, no, that's not so. Everything's relative. So therefore, what may be true for you, that's fine. But that's not true for me, and that's quite okay. And everybody else, everybody has their own truth. And that's fine. Not a problem. Have you run across such people when you talk to them about the things of God and they say, well, that's, that's just your interpretation of Scripture, but, but I interpret a different way. Run across that. That's postmodernism. It's okay. You can have your truth and I can have mine. And all of those different truths, it doesn't matter if there's a million different truths, that's all just fine and that's okay. All of this in direct opposition to what Christ teaches us in His truth. The result of all this, the Bible then becomes only as relevant as you want to make it. You can pick and choose what you want to believe in various doctrines. You can throw out this one. You can take that one. Everybody's interpretation is good and acceptable. And the result is utter confusion and the loss of the unchanging gospel of Jesus Christ. I trust that you can see how vital sola scriptura is for us. I trust that you can see how the unchanging God, His unchanging truth found in the unchanging Scripture is so important still for us today. That it's vital to know the importance of sola scriptura, just as vital as the Reformers knew it to be back in their day. That it's still just as vital to apply this truth to our own hearts to submit ourselves to the beautiful truth of the Word of God. Even today, I, I would exhort you, don't submit yourself to the PRC. Don't submit yourself to the EPC. Submit yourself to God. Submit yourself to Christ. And hear the faithful truth of of the Word of God, as it is preached by the PRC and the EPC, and submit yourself to Christ in His Word. It's Scripture alone. It's not men, and it's not individual particular churches, is it? It is the Word of God alone. No church is without its faults, its failings, its sins, its wrongdoings. And we all need to be, as was prayed earlier, reforming and reforming at all times and it's through the word of God that we will do that and it's through the word of God that we will continue to hold on to the truth scripture alone may this speech have added just somewhat to your 
love and appreciation of the Word of God, your determination to know it, to depend upon it, to love it, to defend it. May sola scriptura be the glad and determined declaration of every one of our hearts. Thank you. Our thanks to Reverend Torlock for his instructive speech on sola scriptura and for his stirring exhortation to us to hold to what we have been given in our heritage from the Reformation. We're going to take a quick break. There are refreshments.